Yesterday we started to talk about the concept of conquering the land of Canaan. So we've identified that there's a geographical place called Canaan that was at one point inhabited by seven Canaanite nations. And then the Jewish people had a requirement to go into that land and to conquer it and to turn it into what would be called Eretz Yisrael, which is a holy environment. Before they could do that, they had to send the spies and the goal of the spies is we said yesterday that the goal of the spies is to get a strategy and an understanding of how you go about doing this job, how you go about conquering the land. The truth of the matter is that, in addition to that, the spies also illustrate us what we're supposed to do as, as individuals today. So we're not going to conquer the actual physical land of Israel, but we all have our personal Canaan that we're trying to conquer. So you read the story of the spies and you learn things about how you're supposed to do it. So the first thing we need to do is identify, we've already identified that the name Canaan is associated with the concept of investment, the idea of a trader. That means to say that it has value, it has the potential to produce a lot of value, and that's the value that we're looking for. And that's why we go to conquer the land. But today what we have to look at more specifically is to understand the concept of the seven nations who occupy that land. Okay, so if we want to turn Canaan around... And we've understood that Canaan is the immature version of myself, the raw version of myself that has to become a more developed spiritual version. So the question is, who are the seven nations? Okay, Because that's what I have to conquer. I have to conquer the seven nations. So who are these seven nations? Where do I find them? And the answer to that is very interesting. That we're told that each of us, our, our personality, the makeup of our personality, which in turn is a reflection of our soul, has seven elements to it. That's what we call the seven midois, the seven character traits of a person. Now, a person is a complex being. I mean, anybody will know if you deal with people that people can be very complex. But what we mean by a complex being specifically is that you don't have a single soul. You actually have two souls. There's what we call the nefesh kiss. The divine soul, which is it's literally a piece of Hashem that lives inside of us. And that's the part of us that allows us to feel inspired. That's the part of us that allows us to transcend ourselves. That's the part that keeps us connected to Hashem. Unfortunately, that is also the part of ourselves that we are often not in touch with. Then we have what is called the Nefesh HaBahamis, which is the animalistic soul. Now, the job of the Nefesh HaBahamis, by and large, is to keep us alive. If we didn't have those animalistic impulsive drives, then we wouldn't look after our own survival. We'd be too busy trying to fly away with the angels. you know. So you need this animal soul. It's a really important part of who we are because it keeps us grounded and it keeps us alive and it uh, motivates self-preservation and things like that. It's really, really important. The unfortunate thing is that it's like an animal, which means that it acts on impulse. And impulses are not always healthy. Sometimes instinct is exactly what you need, but often impulse is not what you need. So if we're going to talk about seven facets of character or seven elements of the soul, we have to realize that the seven elements as they express themselves through the neshama will be very different to the seven as they express themselves through the animal soul. And that's what Kana'an means. Kana'an means that my, my persona is occupied by the seven nations of Kana'an, which means that my reality, my experience of life, my personality, the way that I engage with the world, etc., is defined by and led by the impulses of my animal. So that's not a good place to be. That could, that could land us up in lots of trouble. So the goal is to work with that. And the goal is to try and shift ourselves. So now, obviously, before you can shift yourself, you have to have a little bit of an understanding of what these seven are. And then we could talk about how you go about conquering these seven nations. So let's do a brief description of what the seven are. They are named Chesed, Gevura, Teferes, Netzach, Hoid, Yesoid, and Malchus. And while each of them really deserves attention in its own time, and they really deserve a whole analysis independently of each other, today we're just going to do a brief overview of what the seven are, and that will give us at least something to appreciate about ourselves, even if it's just headlines, so we know what it is that we're supposed to be working with. Chesed is always translated as kindness. And the problem with that is that the minute somebody hears the word kindness, you automatically assume, oh, it must be good. What could be bad about kindness? 
we always just assume that if a person is a kind person, that's better than if a person, for example, is an unkind person or a selfish person or a stingy person. That's just what we assume. And it's true, in its healthy form, kindness is a very good trait to have. But when it's an impulsive kindness, it's actually extremely dangerous. So for example, here's two examples that we could all relate to. Let's say, God forbid, that somebody was in a life-threatening situation. Let's say that somebody attacked another person. So the person comes at someone with a knife or with a gun. This is not a time for kindness. <laughs> As the victim, or as a witness to the, to the event, it's not a time for kindness. You don't say, look, we have to understand where this person comes from. They were bullied when they were young, so they, they have aggression issues. They're in therapy. Give them a little bit of time. You know? No, right now they're about to stab somebody. It's inappropriate to be kind at that particular point in time. Or alternatively, could you imagine, God forbid, you had a doctor who was kind? I mean, you want your doctor to be friendly and sympathetic. You don't want your doctor to be kind. You don't want your doctor to turn around and say, okay, listen, you have this issue, but I know it's going to be a painful procedure, so we won't do it because I feel bad. <laughs> it's not what you want. So kindness in its unhealthy form can actually be dangerous. Now, for us, that's what happens to us a lot. Some of us are predisposed to kindness. That's like our dominant feature. And when we allow it to become impulsive, animalistic kindness, that's exactly what we do. We tolerate things that should never be tolerated. And we, um, we cut people slack when actually they should be called out and disciplined. A, a parent who only uses kindness, for example, is going to produce bratty children. So that's unhealthy kindness. On the opposite side of that scale, you have what is called gavura. Now, gavura is usually translated as strength. But actually, it refers specifically to the, st the strength of self-containment. So discipline, the ability to withdraw when appropriate. So a healthy gvura is one of the best attributes that a person can ever have. Because you know when to keep your mouth shut. And you know what business not to interfere in. And you know how to self-discipline. That would be a great thing. But if it's the animalistic, impulsive gvura, well, then it becomes things like being selfish, I'm going to pull back because it's not in my interest, so I, I'm sorry, don't expect me to contribute. Selfishness, stinginess, and even aggression. So if a person might be dominant in the Gavura side, you'll find that that's exactly what they are. They're a more aggressive personality or a more self-centered personality. The third element is what we call Tiferes. Now usually Tiferes is very healthy because Tiferes, as opposed to Chesed and Gavura, which are actually two extreme positions, Tiferes is a pretty um, a centered position. It's a balanced position. And Tiferes is usually translated as, as uh, sorry, as Rachamim. Rachamim is compassion. Compassion is a very positive thing. I mean, incredibly positive. More than kindness, you want compassion. Because the nature of kindness is that I am kind, whereas the, nation of co the nature of compassion is I actually care about you. It's a big difference. Very often the chesed person just goes out, you know, dishing out kindness all over the place without considering what's actually useful for the recipient. Whereas the compassionate person wants to be empathetic, wants to understand what you need and how to provide it for you. So usually, Rachamim Tiferes is an incredibly healthy place to be. How could it get corrupted? Well, this is how it gets corrupted. When you see people who really, really mean well and they take on everybody else's stuff to the point that they get so weighed down because they're trying so hard to be empathetic that they've lost the capacity to be able to distinguish between your issues and my issues. And so the person starts to become upset because of what's happening to you or depressed because of what's happening to you or eventually become so wrung out because they're listening to everybody else and helping everybody else and carrying everybody else and don't know how to create their own space. So it, they start to drown in their compassion. Alternatively, Another corrupted version of compassion is where you start to take on the toxins of other people. So not only do you take on all their stuff and say, you know, you care about it, but their bad behavior actually starts to influence you because you're so compassionate and so empathetic that you, instead of helping them, they start to drag you into their world. <laughs> and that's the person who says, well, you know, I really understand what you're going through and it's, it's a really terrible thing. And, and, and maybe I should support the terrible thing, as opposed to saying, maybe I should help you get out of the terrible thing. That's when we become an enabler. So that would be unhealthy Tiferes. Then you have Netzach. Netzach is very valuable because Netzach is the ability to be tenacious and committed. 
everybody knows that you could be the kindest person in the world or the most disciplined person in the world for a period of time. The challenge in life is to do it in a sustained way. That's always what we battle with. How do I keep this going? So I was inspired for a period of time. Or I was feeling kind for a period of time. Or I felt love for a, a period of time. But now it's kind of worn off. And how do I keep myself committed to the minion I was going to, to the relationship that I'm in, to the business idea that I'm trying to get off the ground but it's not really working? So perseverance is very valuable and positive. When it becomes corrupted, it turns into stubbornness. The inability to let go. The inability to be flexible. The inability to shift when the time requires it. Because you insist that things have to be the way that you've always seen them be. Then you get hoid. Hoid, number five on the list. Hoid is acceptance. It's an incredible trait for people who have it. Humility and the ability to acknowledge that I was wrong and to accept another point of view. It's incredibly valuable for growth and for learning. But when it gets corrupted, then hoid becomes, I have no self. I have no self-esteem. I'm, I'm worried to, to say what I feel. I'm embarrassed of who I am. Unfortunately, Jews very often suffer from this complex. I'm afraid to say that this is a Jewish thing. I'd rather show that it's a universal thing. Or I'm afraid to say that I actually believe in old Jewish values because modern liberal values seem to contradict those values. So it's that headspace when Hoyt becomes corrupted where a person has no backbone. As the prophet Yeshaya criticizes the Jewish people, he says you've become a lost sheep. As opposed to being an assertive crowd who can teach the world values, the gift that Hashem gave us in the Torah, you become a lost sheep who doesn't quite know who you are. Yesoid is the number six midah, the number six trait. And that is, Yesoid means foundation, and it effectively means the capacity to be able to connect with others. In other words, it's the basis for all relationship is Yesoid. So I've gone through all these internal experiences, because if you're honest about it, are internal works. Nobody necessarily knows that I feel a love towards them. Nobody necessarily knows that I feel aggression towards them. I don't always have to express it in order to feel it. Yesoid is that bridge that starts to say, so how am I going to connect this to the next person or to the next experience? So let's say, for example, I love going to shul. So the yesoid would be, so how am I actually going to go to shul? Or let's say, for example, the person says that I need to be a little bit more cautious around that particular individual because they're not a good influence in my life. So yesoid is, let me start thinking what steps I can actually take pragmatically to create that appropriate distance. Unhealthy yesoid is when I become too invested in things that are unhealthy. So whether that be the way I eat, whether it be the things I, I watch on TV, whether it be the, the, the um, thought processes that are allowed to take form, and I become very connected to them. I, they actually become personal to me. And if something unhealthy becomes personal to me, well, that's not a healthy place to be. And the last one is called Malchus. Malchus is how I express myself. So it relates to speech, and more generally it relates to leadership. So, of course, speaking and leading could be something really healthy or it could become co totally corrupted and a person could speak in a horrible way, inappropriate way, dishonest way, or could lead in a belligerent way or in an inappropriate way. So that's basically a very quick headline of the seven different traits. Now, each of us will know that out of the seven, some of them are more do dominant in our personality. And the concept of trying to conquer the land of Canaan and turn it into Israel is to try and shift something of my personality. Now that might sound more difficult than it is to just talk about. It is easier said than done. And that's what we'll continue to explore, please God, tomorrow.